sleep, get yourself some coffee, get started. I'm so happy to have him back. I thought yesterday was fantastic. I really enjoyed the opportunities I had to listen to everything. Not only the panelists had to say, but we had some really lively discussion. And that's, that's what peacemaking is about. So I'm really happy that everyone's willing to contribute and lend their knowledge and expertise. So this morning we're going to talk about peacemaking from the bench. Probably going to end up being a revolution in how this, this gets started because it comes with a sort of seal of approval already, and then we can get it out and let it be what, what works best for us and what we want it to be. So, we have a terrific panel here. We have Michael Fatoski, who is a judge at the Okanagan Band of Potawatomi Indian Tribal Court, and we have what I'm told is the birthday boy here, Judge uh, Tim Connors. He's a judge at the Washita County Trial Court. I don't know if we're up for a big round of happy birthday, but if that's something that people are wanting, just let me know. I can do that. <laughs> and then, of course, we have the Honorable Michael Smith, who's the District Court Judge at the Sac Fox Tribal Court. So, I'm excited to see what these guys are today. Thanks, you guys, for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank
bringing that problem to tribal court. Matter of fact, for such a small group of people, they bring everything to court. You know, if, if they've got a problem, they're taking it to court. I don't care what it is. And uh, our dockets, we have a full flavor of cases. Um, you know, criminal, civil, uh, tribal religious issues, uh, burial issues, governmental conflicts, uh, all the domestic cases that you can think of. And so consequently, when I'm on the bench, I try to make sure that I'm sensitive to that because I'm a Chickasaw, they're sacrificed. You know, that, that works well for them in that if they decide they really don't like me very much, they can certainly get rid of me without hurting, uh, injuring the community. I, I think that's something that thought up for me. Hurt me. But whenever I've got an issue that is a Sack and Fox internal issue, I ask the clerks to bring in elders to uh, give testimony on these kinds of cases. I find that that's the most effective way to kind of deal with some of the things that I don't know about. Uh, you know, things like powwow or burial issues or uh, any kind of religious <coughs> things that you know, I have no knowledge of. And so, they're, and they're comfortable with that, and uh, they don't mind me sitting and uh, helping them through their difficulties. But uh, they do like it that we bring in the cultural people whenever we need to. But mostly for the peacemaking aspects, uh, you know, we try to keep the uh, when we're talking about conflicts in a very close. We need to make sure that when the people leave the courthouse, they've been treated with respect, uh, they have their dignity, they feel like that they've been heard. And so we let them tell their story. Whatever it is, whatever they have to say, this is their opportunity to say it. And, and mostly when court is adjourned, uh, people are not bitter about the outcomes. They feel like they've had an opportunity to uh, have their case heard and they really don't resent uh, having been judged and whether they win or lose. We also try to make sure that we're not going to talk in a bad way unless we just have to. Uh, that's something I learned from peacemaking. If I can keep that kind of language out of the courtroom, uh, but sometimes you can't, quite frankly. Some things have to be said. But, but generally speaking, in matters of uh, forces or paternity where there's children involved, most parents feel like the other parents are a pretty decent parent. And they wouldn't really want other people talking about their spouse or their loved one in a negative way, like they would like to come to court and try to disparage the other party. So quite frankly, I don't see any purpose for that. I understand that there's a conflict, that there's a grievance, and there's been a wrong done to people. But generally speaking, the people that come there have more in common than they have in diversity. And I try to focus on that and remind them that our, our, what's important is the child, and they're going to be learning how to deal with their conflicts, from their parents, uh, how to deal with their relationships from their parents, so that we need to get away from the ugly, uh, divisive talk that goes on sometimes in these familial conflicts. And if you focus on the child, you won't have any problems. If you focus on the relationship that you have at the top, it's fraught with problems. You're going to have nothing but problems, and you'll be in the court over and over again. So those are kind of aspects of peacemaking that come through, and it's really, like I said, they're tools in a toolbox, and I pull them out whenever I need them. I, I use them in my law practice as well. You know, if I've got a client, I know that it would be better for them to settle than it would be to litigate. It's not hard to steer the conversation towards some sort of agreement. Um, I know in uh, the Chickasaw Nation, the peacemaking uh, aspect of that court is different than 
the second box doesn't have a piece of it. Um, in the Chickasaw Nation, they have a, uh, we have a peacemaking court there where the, you have to volunteer to go. So consequently, it may be underutilized a little bit, I think. And when you do go, those orders are reduced to an order, and they can either be put in a file as part of the case, because usually they don't have an opportunity to get into peacemaking until they come to it. So that's kind of a different approach altogether, uh, but it's a much more sophisticated, bigger process. Uh, Chickasaw Nation handles more cases than the county. Um, so we're, we're a busy court, even though we're limited in the scope of the cases that we do handle. Um, that's just kind of my own view of how it goes, so I don't want to take a whole time, so I'll, I'll pass it on. Thank you.
It was uh, 60 years ago today, at this time, in the day, that my mother broke water in the middle of a hurricane in Providence, Rhode Island. My dad was at the hospital. She couldn't reach him while the fall lines were down. She went out in the street and waved down a taxi cab. And they made her way to the hospital, and I wandered into this world. And it was two years ago, to this day, at this time, that my wife, Margaret, our, grand, our daughter, Caitlin, broke water in England and delivered us our first grandson. Now, I say this, and I'm very grateful for that, but I'm grateful for all the women and the fact that without women, none of us would be here and the tremendous sacrifice they give to all of us to help us be part of this experience together. I also say it because it is actually the foundation for my belief in those of us in Washington County and what we hope to establish with a peacemaking court in a state court system. <clears throat> One of the elders in our state in sharing with us describe the medicine wheel as it relates to institutions like ours. And he shared that all of us come into the world through this water, through our mother. We had shared that heartbeat. In fact, the heart, I've been told from cardiologists, is the first organ that forms in the womb. And we are in touch with our mother, and suddenly it breaks, and the umbilical cord is cut. And then each of us um, have to draw air to breathe, no longer from our mother, and nourish from the earth. So we all share the same umbilical cord. And when children come in, like all young things, they're vulnerable. Without us, without each other, they would die fairly soon. So what the spirit comes in that body and gives is trust, trust and faith. And they put trust and faith into their families, families in the circle put trust and faith into communities, and communities put trust and faith into institutions, and that's where it breaks down for state court systems among other state institutions. Because at that point, institutions forget that trust and faith mean responsibility. And instead, institutions translate trust and faith into power and authority instead of putting it back in. I thought that was very profound. Contemplated on it quite a bit. And I shared it with others, and it was based on that in part, and based on my association with leaders like Judge Potosky and Judge Pope, that I said, you know, we are really missing the boat in our state court system. Because while I had heard for a long time about the benefits, alternative dispute resolution and the arguments that it was a better or a more appropriate way for uh, an adversarial system, I came to the belief that peacemaking was something much more, much deeper, much more uh, what it should be for all of us. And I thought we need to be able to open that door in the state court system. So we um, were able to convince in large part, I must say, because of the relationship of Judge Potosky with our Supreme Court Justice, and in part from the personal relationship with my wife Margaret, who's here with a new, another Supreme Court Justice just elected, Bridget McCormick, to convince them that they should not be threatened 
by this concurrent path. That this path that said, not all human conflict should be resolved in the way we currently do it. And particularly when there's ongoing relationships, this path may prove to do better justice. <clears throat> so I had to get, I think that's what I was saying to Sean yesterday, I had to get, because it's a state court system, a very young base that you don't have to do that. You have to get your community to agree. But because I was in that limited structure, I had to get authority in order to allow this. We did. And we've been doing that for about a year now. <clears throat> the exploration and training, of course, continues. It was with Judge Bastille now in Texas in April. And I was in South Carolina in June. And um, you see from all over the country that these pockets, these paths that are being opened, uh, really are signaling a way that we can do things better and in a healthier way. <clears throat> what are the <clears throat> I think that the problem with the state court systems, of course, despite that, besides the fact that it's based when you read Walter Epelhoff's book on the Ten Worst Pieces, um, which really does outline it, and that the our system uh, in this country, which was based on colonization and exploitation, our laws still reflect that. <clears throat> and when he talks about the, the dark roots, the dark roots in our law, which still is there, it's the law when it talks about um, those who were here before us. That root is a label. It is a label and a term that was applied in the law about a group of people. That label still exists in those cases that are used and cited as precedent for decisions made today. And that label needs to be uprooted and sent where it belongs, which is a fiction that was created to do a bad thing and no longer has use or happiness. So when we talk about uprooting the fictitious root, we need to then replace it in the English system with the true root. And the true root is peacemaking. So the argument for and the process of opening up this concurrent path in the state court system is the recognition that the label of a root was a fictitious creation it only served to hurt when you pull it out and replace it. One of the challenges that we face, of course, is this inability to even talk about our heart and spirit in relation. So the reason so many of our laws are in balance that it's always about the mind and the body. How do we control the body? Our system is completely designed on we want to control a group of people or, or kind of action. So we will place a label on that. And if they do it, we place the label on them. And then we throw the punishment at that as an alleged deterrence. That presupposes that the label or the law is good in the first place. But if we had been approaching our laws with the incorporation of the heart and the spirit, I don't believe we ever could have created a law that ever would have been signed that would have said, this man has the right to own me as another human being. Or that that man has the right to push me in the place I have always lived. See? So, in going to 
state court systems and trying to talk about it, I've always had to find bridges and ways to translate that so that it will be heard by those who don't share it in their knowledge. And Judge Fairbanks helped me because she said, you need to be able to speak with this to people who are, come from where you come all Irish. She says, I have this book for you. Have you not read this book? I said, what is it? She says, Anam Kar. I said, yeah, I know all that. And she says, have you read it? I said, well, my dad gave it to me. Well, my dad told me to get it and read it too. She says, have you read it? I said, well, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting to that. And then she just looked at me and said, well, no, I haven't. So she said, you need to read that. Because those are your bones, that's your blood, that's your soul, from your ancestors. But those words are the same words. I have been able to use them. They were given to me by a friend. Those are the words that will help you to translate so that those are here. This was just a couple of weeks ago when I got back. Margaret was able to come with me that trip. She picked me up at the airport and said, Can we stop at the bookstore before we go home? And, uh, she looked at me and said, I think I better get it. And I want to thank Judge Fairbanks for that. Then I called my dad up and said, hey, Dad, you know that book you told me about? some said, yeah. So, well, I'm reading it now. I said, well, that's good because the house in Ireland is named after that. I said, that's a good thing I did. So one of the teachings in Nishnabe uh, and the fires in our region, so as we learn from that, one of the teachings, of course, is love. And I really think that's at the hallmark of peacemaking. And it's been really sad that so much has been said about you know, kind of what we've done in the, in the state court system that love becomes about sex and lust and advertising and false values and totally misses the point. But it is said to know peace is to, to know love is to know peace. And so I think we do have to start from that standpoint rather than the label Here's your punishment, and I'm judging you. I'm judging you. You're a bad person. I think the judge was saying, coming in, unless we really have to talk about a bad, bad thing, and judging, we come out of love. And I want to share these two passages, Judge Fair Things, because this is what I've been reflecting on since. One passage says this, we are always on a journey from darkness into light. At first we are children of the darkness. Your body and your face were formed first in the kind darkness of your mother's womb. Your birth was a first journey from darkness into light. All your life, your mind lives within the darkness of your body. Every thought that you have is a flint moment, a spark of light from your inner darkness. The miracle of thought is its presence in the night side of your soul. The brilliance of thought is born in darkness. Each day is a journey. We come out of the night and into the day. On love, These words I found particularly helpful for us, those of us who are thinking of peacemaking and using love for the bench. When love awakens in your life in the night of your heart, it is like the dawn breaking within you. Where before there was anonymity, now there is intimacy. Where before there was fear, now there is courage. Where before in life there was awkwardness, now there is a rhythm of grace and gracefulness. Where before you used to be jagged, now you are elegant and in rhythm with yourself. When love awakens in your life, it is like a rebirth. The seven grandfather teachings has been used in 
in our tribal courts and share it with us. The reflection is always, these are not tools to judge another. These teachings are for you to go within yourself and ask, am I living this way? And as you do that process, you begin to emanate that out. And so when you are in the courtroom and there is this human conflict, and there are these problems, as you come from that place, and as each of us come from that place, that spirit takes over and provides us the path for resolution. I think that's really the fundamental core of this work. So that's the why. Why do we do it? <clears throat> By recognizing, usually everybody wants to go to the Ruba when we're out and we'll go there. But I don't see much reason in doing things unless we understand why we're doing it. And if it comes from a deep place, then the who, the what, the when, the where, the how. We started a year ago, and at the time I had taken an assignment as a probate judge, which meant I was dealing with the docket of the most vulnerable. That meant people who had cognitive or minds weren't working well, either because of trauma at birth, because of trauma during their lifetime, because of the aging process, or because of mental illness. And I also had the docket that dealt with the distribution of goods, things, objects, after people had walked on and those left behind were fighting over that. And I had the docket of children where parents were separated and they were caught in between. I also had a very small part of the juvenile court, and I knew that I was going to be taking over the juvenile court, so I wanted to try this concrete path and probate. Um, we had our local tribes come and help us in training. We recruited from a diverse number in our community. We did start with people who had a background in mediation or dispute resolution restorative justice to take it further. Our county is about 350,000 people. We have three major two major universities and another four-year college and a community college. So it's a very diverse population. And it has, we're on the border of Wayne County, which is Detroit, so we have a lot of the same kinds of problems that major cities have. And I think we've done about maybe 45 cases in, that, in the year, something along those lines. <clears throat> it is something that we offer and that all participants have to agree to. But it has been used successfully uh, in a wide range of cases. In one case, a couple have been fighting for 15 years. It's been over $200,000 on attorneys evaluators, mediators, facilitators, expert therapists, psychological evaluations, blown through a number of judges, etc. And by the time they came, both attorneys were throwing their hands in court saying, Judge, he is really, he's psycho, he's, I mean, he is really a problem. You need to throw him, hold him in contempt, throw him in jail to give him a message. And of course, his attorney saying, Judge, she is really a problem. This is a classic case of parental alienation. She's passive aggressive. You need to throw her in jail so that she gets the point. <clears throat> Not a pretty picture, I would say. Huh? But instead, I said, Well, we have this new thing that's been allowed with peacemaking. Never would anyone take this could be a knowledgeable case. But at the end of the day, these are your children. They came out of you, man. Spark from him in the bond. And I can consider, I don't know what good it would be if both parents are sitting in jail. I don't know who's going to take care of the kids. Would you try? Would you try? Would you open your hearts? If 
far as I think about that, would you try this? And the attorney said, there's no way this is going to work. They were frustrated. They were saying, you know, Judge, we appreciate you trying these things. It's always going to work. So we thought maybe the attorneys wouldn't be good in that circle. <laughs> yeah. Our instinct was right. We spent, they spent five hours and was all about a year ago when things have been going okay. We actually used it in a complex civil case where the plane was built in Texas, service, uh, maintenance service in, outside, uh, in Michigan outside of Detroit, took off and crashed in Mexico, killing both pilots and their families were suing complex litigation all over the place and a lot of damages. And the insurance company for the um, airlines was saying, here's the dollar amount that's it, nothing else. The family say, we're not going to take it, we're going to trial, we've been about three or four week trial. Everybody showed up for trial. And I asked that they come in the week before and we sat in a circle. And We've used it in complex cases involving distribution of estates, and it's worked well. And now we have started in the area that I really think, which matters because I started this conversation this morning about what do we all share, and that's that we all come from our mothers and our children, our state, and that's in juvenile. So we are using it both in the delinquency and in the abuse and neglect. Um, we view our role as a responsibility, not power or authority, which means our responsibility extends to the children and the families and community before they come into court, while they're in the jurisdiction of the court, and after they go back out. And so part of that medicine wheel we talked about is when institutions think in terms of power authority, they become silos. And the children and the families and community are bounced around between those silos. Instead of saying the institution, the court, is one part of this larger circle. So that is, we hope, of course, the outcomes of that will help to keep kids out of foster care, help to restore families, help to do it in a healthier way. I handed out, those of you who are here a little earlier, I handed out the brochure that we just had published in through the year. I have some more available to you. It, it outlines a lot of these basics. <clears throat> I do want to say that at the front is a horse. This was done by one of our local artists in Ann Arbor. Um, my wife was an artist before she was a lawyer displayed in the Ann Arbor Art Fair. We were walking this year. And I, you know, I love my wife dearly. I don't love the crowds like she does. So she loves to go to the art fairs and I come along and I'm, I'm truly I'm counting the minutes that I can get out of there. <laughs> but I saw this horse from across the way and I was so drawn to it. I went over and the artist wasn't there. And we tracked her down and I said, you know, your horse, there's, there's two stories. You know, there's the four horses in the apocalypse. And they all represent destruction and pestilence and all the worst of things. But then there's a horse, the story of the four horses of the peacemaker, and each bringing a gift. And at the end, the one stallion saying, climb upon me, you are carrying this burden. I will help you carry this burden of good work. I said, so that's what I see in your I'd like to use it if it's all right. And we'll pay you, but we'd like to use it for our symbol. And she said, no, you can use it. You can use it. I never even looked at it that way. And I was so struck by it, and I have to tell you, my wife surprised me. Right before we came out, she went to the artist, and she said, will you make him a piece for his 60th birthday? And she did. But when you read about that, it really is that symbol of a way of looking and the way what we choose to have it represent. And do we feel
feed the good wolf or do we feed the bad wolf? The current state system feeds the bad wolf. Peacemaking feeds the good wolf. And that cuts across all cultures. Because I deal in the state system and because I deal in labels, I am wrapping up with politics. <clears throat> because I deal in state system, because I have to translate it in a brochure, we have statistics. I don't believe in statistics. I think they demean us. I think they make human beings into numbers, and when we start talking about human beings as to numbers, we can fool ourselves into taking actions that have been very destructive. But if that's what you want, we put it in statistics. At the back are the more important comments. I'd like to share those quickly, go over those with you, and have one final thought. Because if it's our responsibility in courts to put that trust and faith back in in a healthy way into our communities and into our children, these are the types of ways we evaluate whether this makes sense what we're doing. Here are the four comments that we chose from many. <clears throat> I learned that the others and myself all had truth. It just needed to be placed together. The second participant. I learned never to say never. We did something that I thought impossible. The third. I learned that there are many different versions and perspectives to the truth. You need to be open to being empathetic and make an effort to accept the other's view or beliefs. Not to try to change them, but to accept them as their truth. And finally, a fourth from one of the lawyers. I have no doubt in my mind that if this guardianship petition would have gone through the normal court procedure, there would be no mother-daughter relationship today. The peacemaking court saved one of the most important relationships one can experience, the parent-child relationship. Um, before I close, I want to say, because I believe so strongly in this, it's important, it, I felt it was important, that this not be another ADR tool, another diversionary program, but in fact embraced by the court, recognized by our appellate courts as a concurrent path. And as a result, um, many times I sit in the circles at the beginning come off the bench and sit down with the lawyers and the parties and talk in the background of what's really before us to start the beginning work. Then they go and work. And if they come back on the referrals from other judges, we will take any type of case. But if they come back and they'll say, I'll keep it as the judge, I'll make a record, it can go out on appeal, but I'm not letting go. If you come into peacemaking, I will stay with you as long as I'm on the bench. In closing, I really believe profoundly that we're all here and drawn to this for a reason, and that we have, because we're drawn to it we're now, no longer ignorant about it. We can't claim we didn't know anything about it. That fire has been lit inside of us. And so we need to feed each other's fire and help each other in whatever community we're in. And I go back when Judge Fairbanks said, if you do nothing else than read that first poem, I've used it myself. Um, I've had to change the words a couple of times for Indian communities, but the thought is the same. I'm not going to change the words. It's from Ireland, but there is a word I should just tell you. There's a word called "correct." Correct is a small ship that the Irish use to to catch fish. It's made out of canvas, and that's all of my ancestors when they came from Ireland were fishermen. So here is the blessing to close from Ireland for all of us who want to do peacefully. <coughs> On the day when the weight deadens on your shoulders and you stumble, may the clay dance beneath you to balance you. And when your eyes freeze behind the gray window and the ghost of the 
loss gets into you. A flock of colors. Indigo, red, green, and azure blue come to awaken in you a meadow of delight. When the canvas frays in the curve of thought and a stain of ocean blackens beneath you, may there come across the water a path of yellow moonlight to bring you safely home. May the nourishment of the earth be yours. May the clarity of light be yours. May the fluency of the ocean be yours. May the protection of the ancestors be yours. And so, may a slow wind work these words of love around you, an invisible cloak to my truth. Well, thank goodness I know a lot of you here already. And those of you who know me know that I'm a troublemaker. Uh, I'll tell you, I had fun last night trying to go to sleep thinking uh, uh, about this. And uh, one of the things that I learned, again, relearned from all of you is that I need to treat everybody with dignity. So I can't play those practical jokes and pranks that I had planned on playing on Judge Connors this morning. Uh, but, you know, it's time to get this party rocking. And uh, let's sing happy birthday to him. And I'm going to ask his wife to lead us.
uh, Michigan. And uh, I have had uh, many learning experiences in my 30 years as, as a travel judge. And one of those learning experiences was uh, fairly early on in my career, one of our uh, community members came into court and he said, tossed his head around very contemptuously and said, damn, this looks like a white man's court. And it really set me on a journey to think as a travel judge and as a travel official, what should our court look like? What should the facilities look like? And so in many of our uh, communities where I work, we spend a great deal of time thinking about that. And, uh, and having the court room, the facilities reflect who we are uh, as Native people with some of our own art from the community. And, uh, and we've done a really good job with that. But I was recently presenting at a conference a couple of years ago, and, and there was one of another speaker on the panel. And basically, uh, as we were chatting later, it occurred to me, she said, you know, you've done, you've done a good job bringing the material culture of the community into the facility and courtroom. But for me, a companion piece is the topic uh, and, uh, of this conference and of this presentation, and that is, what are we, what are we doing uh, beyond just the material culture in terms of, of uh, who we are. You know, I say to people, to staff, our judges, we say as Indian people, we have a different worldview, that our values are different. And it seems to me if that's true, we ought to be able to articulate what that worldview is, what those differences are, and be able to demonstrate how uh, they're reflected in how we think about justice and how we do business in our court. One of the things that we have is that in our current court facility is that poster by Sam English. And I think many of you know Sam. Uh, he's a Turtle Mountain um, uh, Chippewa artist who's lived in Albuquerque for his life done a number of posters for uh, Native conferences. And uh, do you think if you went into a state court, you would see a poster that looked, said, demonstrated sacred justice? To me, what a concept that is. And I said many times that, uh, you know, the court processes of dominant society, it seems to me if justice is achieved in individual cases, it's purely by accident. I don't think it's design. I don't think it's the focus. In fact, I know that many of you would agree with me. One of the uh, things that I realized fairly early on in my career is that as a travel judge establishing a travel court in a community, there were going to be two significant challenges. One is respect for within the community, which is not an easy thing. Uh, Judge Connors have kind of alluded to this. You know, I've lived life as an Indian person. And I've lived in an Indian community, and I know what we think about judges. I know what we think about courts. And I know what we think about law enforcement. And those views that we have carry over to how we perceive our own institutions and can carry over. So I realize this is going to be an uphill journey in terms of earning respect within the community in terms of how we handle cases. 
In addition, uh, well, the other significant challenge is credibility from without the community. Because whether we like it or not, we exist in a fishbowl. And people are peering in and they're measuring what we do by their standards and by their values. You know, I have one of my law school classmates here. And, uh, you know, we graduated from law school. We went back to our tribal communities. And I had the good fortune of watching a few episodes of Perry Mason when I was growing up. So I thought I knew what it was going to take to establish a court. But it didn't take me long to realize how destructive the adversarial process is to relationships in the community. One of the things that we heard yesterday from Judge Fairbanks is the positive effects of ripples in the community in regard to peacemaking. A focus for me has been the negative effects of using the adversarial process and how that ripples throughout the community. After Judge Peterson and I are gone from the community, because whether we like it or not, we're getting older, and we're not going to be there forever, some of the ways that we handle things today will continue to reverberate in this community. In fact, our, I think our community is a lot like this fountain. A lot like the fountain because of all the things that uh, Mike mentioned. Uh, the Pokagon Band is very much like Sack Fox in terms of its size. Uh, when people come to the courthouse to duke it out and to resolve their conflict in this adversarial mode, uh, they don't disappear dissolving the larger society not to see each other again. We're neighbors. We work in the next building. We might work in the next Paul, we might be related to some of these folks. In fact, we probably are in one way or another. Or our parents were friends with the extended family of the parties or grandparents. And so uh, these kinds of matters are, are, are very close to us. Judge Connors asked the question, why? Why peace Here is what I think the answer is, is to avoid the destructive effects of the adversarial model, the tool that we typically use, and the other reason, bottom line, to be effective. I had the good fortune of being the chief judge in my own tribal community for 16 years. And I felt very acutely the duty to be effective. Now, I've always taken a particular interest in juvenile matters. I'm not sure why, but I have. And fairly early on in my career, I began realizing I was seeing some of the same people come back to the system. And it was very clear that uh, we needed to do something different. I mean, after all, what do they say? Can you, you keep doing the same things? You're going to expect different results, right? And in my mind's eye, I could see them sitting there at the table, and they would be scratching their head, saying to themselves, that the guy out there doesn't know anything about me, what I'm putting up with at home what's going on in school, but usually they were polite enough to know what needed to be said, or smart enough to know uh, to say the right things. But I realized as soon as they hit the door, they would be doing their thing again. And so, uh, it seems to me tribal judges are in a position they have a meaningful impact for people. And I realize as much as anybody how hard life can be and how complicated it can be with all the human stuff that happens.
to all of us and in our families and in our community. And so I feel uh, very strongly that duty to be effective. Now, I'm probably not different than any of you in this room. Uh, and maybe you would not anything profound or any uh, uh, different than probably many, many of you would have done. But I set out on a journey to think about how we could be more effective, how we could have a meaningful impact, and how we could help people. You know, we were tasked with talking about peacemaking from the bench. And it brings to mind, uh, you know, one of the things that really is currently going on at the Pokegan Band where, uh, where I'm working. And that is, uh, we've been talking about peacemaking in the community and, and developing conflict resolution tools uh, for a while. And I've been asked, to, you know, we've been talking about this for a while. When are we going to do something? When, do you, when, when are you actually going to do peace with you? And it occurred to me that what they were talking about is what, uh, when are we going to develop a community-based tool to uh, resolve conflicts and disputes. And so when I think about peacemaking, I uh, I like to think about it uh, from a much higher level and think about Native justice in general. You know, one of the things that uh, we were uh, asked to do when Judge Connors first invited us over to his courtroom and he asked participants, what is it about Native values or principles that uh, have applicability to state courts and there might be some cross-application. And actually, I ask people to think bigger. I ask them to think about Native worldview and how that might be reflected in how we think about justice and justice principles. When people have asked, you know, when are we going to do peacemaking, my response as the chief judge is, we're already doing it. We have judges who understand uh, uh, peacemaking, the fact that we want to use tools that involve the adversarial process, that bring people on a circle so that they can talk and share and say what's on their mind uh, and be part of part of the solution. So actually as we've continued this uh, journey, we have uh, decided a better way to articulate this thing overall is there's three separate strands to the a journey that we're making in the community. One is this Con uh, community-based conflict resolution tool that exists outside of the court. But secondly, to develop tools that are used in the court, by the court, along the various uh, systems of justice that uh, we have. For example, I assert that there are many different systems of justice. We have our adult criminal system, we have our child protection system, we have our probate system, we have our domestic relations system, and as you identify all those various systems of justice and the key players uh, in those, it seems to me it's very easy to identify opportunities to embrace uh, the philosophy, the beliefs, the values of, of, uh, of peacemaking and incorporate those uh, in the process. You know, the very first tribal, uh, excuse me, tribal chairman I worked with, 
a person that I have a great deal of respect for, when I began to note how destructive the adversarial tool was and want to explore developing some other options, other processes, and to learn more about what Native people were doing across this country uh, so that we could expand our horizons and, uh, uh, and learn about the possibilities. He said to me, you can never do this. He said, we've been so assimilated here in Michigan. In fact, you look at our community, we have Catholics in the community. There's a Methodist church uh, in the community. We have traditional people and we have atheists. And, and we've been so assimilated. You will never know what the traditional law was. And as I had an opportunity to think about that, it occurred to me, even if we don't know what the traditional law was, we know what the traditional process was. And that was bringing people together on a circle, talking it through, oh, this is my mom. But my point is, if you don't do what's appropriate for the community, this is what you get. And that's what you should get. And that's my thought. I can't believe that time went by that quickly, but just a couple of uh, things that I'd like to say in regard to peacemaking for the bench is, it seems to me it starts with a judicial mindset. It starts with how you treat people. It starts with how you talk to people. Talk to people in a meaningful way so that they're engaged, so that you can understand what's going on, so that you can identify the problem and engage in problem solving. And really position yourself so that you have a meaningful effect. Just a couple of real quick examples is, it's been my practice for a long time now. Although it didn't start out this way, uh, it has evolved over time, but it's been for a number of years. I do uh, all of our child protection cases. All of our parties are represented by attorneys. Before we convene a hearing, I meet with the attorneys in chambers. We are talking about how things are going. We're identifying problems. We're strategizing on what it is that we can do uh, to uh, what it is we can do to have the kind of effect that we need to have in those kind of cases. I mean, we have obligations to the tribal member child. We have obligations to the child's parents. And I'll tell you, uh, oftentimes we will spend an hour or an hour and a half, even before we go into the courtroom and the case is called. Sometimes it can go quicker than that. Sometimes it takes longer. And we've been pretty successful in uh, having people come to a consensus about what needs to be done and what can be done uh, to accomplish what we need to accomplish. However, since attorneys are involved, sometimes they're, they can agree. I mean, and then we got the courtroom. Let them make their best arguments. And then I, as a judge, will make a decision about uh, you know, the appropriate course of action. But I'll tell you, the attorneys uh, love it because it's a much different experience than they have in state court. Another example in regard to uh, all of this is uh, I was reminded as I was thinking about this presentation 
several years ago in one tribal community, I had a young man who had received a citation for wasting a deer. He had taken a deer's life and then the meat. Uh, it wasn't dressed out in a timely fashion and the meat was wasted. Well, he came in on a citation issued by the conservation department. But instead of just going through the road motions of handling that particular case, fine community service, I found myself to be in a position to engage the young man and talk about the fact that, you know, this deer had given his life to feed this man and his family. What a gift from the Creator. And yet something intervened. He had to go to a park, he had to go to a party or something. I can't remember exactly what had happened that distracted him. And so he didn't timely dress the deer and the meat was wasted. And after we had this conversation, you know, uh, I know that he left that courtroom feeling a lot different than if I had just pushed that case through, imposed a fine, ordered the community service, or gone through road motions. I think the opportunities for us to do things based upon uh, our values and who we are as Indian people are really only limited by our own imagination. And I know that all of you who are judges probably have similar examples and stories that you can share about uh, our approach to ju justice, how it embraces our uh, concept of uh, justice and, and our principles. So that's it for me. The gong went off a long time ago. I said, what, no fire bread? <laughs> and it seems to me if we do this rope kind of justice like Judge Connors is trying to get away from, that's what we ought to begin from our community folks because we're not serving our community the way that we ought to serve our communities. But they don't have to. 
do because it's an agreement. It's really agreement between people. And if you're not going, most people that are invested in the contract, they've had input. It's what the agreement is. Most people want to live up to their agreements. I think. And as a result, they don't have to have an enter normally. And usually it will carry them sometimes. Uh, sometimes it breaks down and they, they're back and forth. But that, that's okay too. But if they want it reduced, they can be reduced to an order. Uh, it can be put in their file. Of course, they can be the that's how they do it at the Chickasaw Nation. They can still want to speak to the other issues. I, I think just in terms of that, one of the things we heard yesterday is, uh, you know, this can look different in different communities based upon context and community need and uh, uh, how it's set up and uh, how, it's, uh, how it's evolved. So I think in different places you would probably get different answers in terms of uh, how this looks. I have one question. But, um, this is for Judge Pekoski. Um, what are you uh, in your court, in the peacemaking court? Um, do you get good support from your upper level, such as the supervisor, uh, such as the tribal council? Uh, and are you having any problems? with separation of powers in your court with decision making. When you make decisions in a peacemaking, well not decisions, but I'm talking about once the, uh, the parties come to an agreement, uh, does some of the parties uh, that are tribal members that are involved, do you have any uh, issues with some of the members going through tribal council and, and, the, and the tribal council wanting to interfere? Do you, do you, all, do you all have any problems with that? I think occasionally uh, people try to use, uh, you know, political persuasion on uh, political people. Uh, but uh, in, in, in all the, I've worked in five different tribal communities to establish the tribal court and serve as the first chief judge. And all the communities have been very different. The Pokagan Bend, where I, I am currently, uh, I'm blessed. I'm blessed uh, because they were my very first client out of law school when I was a staff attorney at Michigan Indian Legal Services 30 years ago. Circumstances now have put the court, I guess, as an institution in a position where uh, the tribal chairman, the vice chair, Two other council members have known me uh, for 30 years. They know what I'm about. They know what I'm up to, how I think. Uh, there's a great deal of respect for separation of powers. It is embodied in the tribal constitution. And it actually is something that we've had to work real hard to earn. Uh, initially, since it was there on paper, uh, we worked real hard to earn it, maintain it. Uh, there's been a great deal of respect, like I said, for that and understanding. Uh, so we've got a lot of support. And I would expect that to continue. Uh, the folks, even though I've known them 30 years, are younger than I am. And uh, I think they'll be in those political positions or in positions of influence in the community for a long time. They're traditional people. They understand this stuff. Uh, they agree with me that we don't need to copy what's going on in state court and be like the state court. To have respect from within the community and uh, and to have credibility uh, from without. I'll tell you what. Uh, if I had to do what Judge Connors did or what Judge Peterson did for. 12 years when he served in the state court and do case after case, Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, it probably wouldn't be for me. In fact, uh, Judge Peterson told me that as a state court judge, it was not very uncommon for him 
to go into court Wednesday morning and have 50 evictions on the docket. Well, how can you even begin to think about delivering effective justice uh, when you have a caseload like that? And I know that Indian country is very diverse. Uh, I mean, a lot of diversity in many different respects. And one of the relative advantages that we have at Cape Band is we do not have an overwhelming caseload. And we can take the time that we need to spend with uh, each case and individual cases and have a meaningful impact in them. So I guess the short answer is, I, I think Pocatons might be unique. There's been very little uh, attempts uh, towards political influence because once tribal members have approached tribal council, they have just said, we're not going there. We're not going there that supports business. That's why we have these institutions set up this way. And tribal council knows that I feel very strongly about this. Even though we call it separation of powers, it's not about power at all. It's about separating out the governmental functions and having a, a uh, independent judiciary that can make decisions impartially based upon the facts of law and nothing else. I think, um, so